I was diagnosed with autism at 45, that is eight years ago now. And part of my autistic uh, awakening and investigations, I decided to ask people I've interacted with how they have experienced me. Honestly, I did not see anything when I knew you when we were younger. Um, I think you were masking pretty well. You know, we didn't interact massive amounts. So we spent time at sports, doing something, doing something active. Um, so I don't think it was anything like your job where there's you know, hierarchies of authority and things like that. We were just friends doing stuff. Back then, we met at University of Cape Town. I was from the oppressed colored kids and he was from the superior first class white people. And we became good friends. We were sprinting buddies and he's actually the first and only white man I ever had in Cape Town. However, back then I was very insecure about who I was and didn't know I was autistic, but I knew I was a colored and I was not from the superior class. And at UCT, that was over 80% white then, I felt really insecure there and was rather quiet and did everything correctly and calmly. Yeah, I think you've definitely relaxed your, your, your image that you project to the outside world and embraced who you are. And I think that's really good. Probably the first thing that I uh, saw about you that was a little bit different was at some point you just said to me, stop sending me jokes and memes. I don't want them. I don't understand them. I'm not interested. Um, but since you've become aware of being autistic and I think you've stopped masking a lot more and you've talked a lot more about your experience. So you can, you can be extremely blunt about stuff. You ask questions that are probably perceived to be inappropriate by most people like how much do you earn and things like that um you also like to get into super intense discussions like analyze things to death debate things there's no have you called yourself an energy vampire and i think that's part of it you get onto a subject and you really want to get into it and discuss it you know there's no <laughs> there's no chilled conversation with you these days uh I think probably those are some of the things I've noticed. I don't subscribe to the idea that, you know, people have fixed conditions that then, um, you know, sort of produce certain definitive behaviors and certain um, character traits and so on. Um, I'm somewhat skeptical about the very idea of a condition and a label. I mean, I think they, you know, they have a use because people can sort of understand that there's a cluster of symptoms and they can sort of understand that, you know, those symptoms are present. The trouble with um, labels is, you know, we people then almost expect certain things that they've heard. They've heard, you know, that when people are have this condition, they behave like that. And then people almost imagine and project those those behaviors. I met this gentleman recently and found that our conversations are like two sports cars on a joy ride always trying to enjoy the roads the curves of the roads and the one who would show life check me out i can do this and the other one who just follow and then the one who is following get a little bit distracted and follow a different route and the other one would just fall in and follow on in this way the lead of the two cars will change all the time and they would both experience a adventurous uh, driving experience over different landscapes and valleys and have a great time. However, it's interesting to hear that um, his first opinion on what you heard in the first clip and uh, his next clip, he goes on to explain how he found my interactions and this is what he said. All right, Mohammed, I would say I'm giving you some feedback um, as you've asked for it. I'd say you come across, you came across to me as intense, very busy, very busy mind. Um, 
no small talk. Talk about things that I find interesting. So I'm going to say very interesting things. Um, a very keen, intelligent, logical, clear mind. No editing. You don't edit. I mean, you just say. Um, you can be quite literal at times. The way you, you communicate, I find, instead of sort of explaining things that many people would explain, you sort of assume they know or would know what you're talking about. So you're a little bit like cryptic almost. I think that's the word in the sense that you can say quite a lot in quite a, you know, a, a, a brief statement and then assume that the person listening understands or fully comprehends or, you know, um, correctly interprets what you're saying. I think you're friendly. I sense you as, as a friendly person. Um, yeah, and uh, yes, maybe a bit defensive. I did say guarded. Mr. Muhammad, what can I say? I've known you since grade four. I've always thought of you as someone special. Chief. This is how I call him in my book, Chicken Legs, A Loner's Way. He is four years older than me and was always the protector in the class, the one who kept uh, everything under control with all the kids who went crazy. He, although he was stronger and bigger than everybody, he never bullied anybody. Even the bullies, he would just pull them off the other kids, not hurt them, just take them off and... Tell them, don't do that. We came from a minority group in Kopei. The education was neglected, so he was forced to repeat. In class, you were very loud. You said what you, what's on your mind. But you, given a task, you were always done 10 minutes or, you know, 15 minutes before the time. So you were just sitting there and you were bored. Having said that, I think people are just judging you on their ability and not seeing beyond their intelligence what you really can achieve. I don't know if you remember Halib, the guy that did Hafiz. When he came to school, um, they actually promoted him to our class. And for me, that was very strange. They could see his potential because of him memorizing the Quran and his, his, his um, mind or his brain was so advanced so that they can memorize things. We were actually more brilliant than him, but they couldn't promote you or they couldn't see there's something special in you. I clicked with you from that time until now. And like I said, you are not just brilliant, you're a special person. But people just couldn't see what's, what's it really all about. Until now, you know, um, autism, uh, they put you under that banner. My first impressions of you, you were a bit loud and I'd say abrasive in the way you spoke. Um, because one of the first things you said to me was, you normal. <laughs> and I was like, what does this guy mean? And then one of the ladies obviously told me that you are part of the autistic persons that was at that uh, event that we had. The, the event was supposed to be for autistic people to, in my opinion, uh, just be free to just be, you know, there without masking and talk and react and do things like they want. And when I discovered or detected that you uh, are not autistic, it was very uh, stressful for me. So this is why I told you, uh, you are normal in the sense that you are not autistic. And what are you doing here? Who are you? It was stressful for me because then I needed to put on a front for you again. Um, so that was my first impressions. Looking at you, I can't say, oh, this guy is autistic. You dress normally as, you know, jean shirt. Well, as did most of the people there that were autistic. You, you can't see someone's autistic. I couldn't. I couldn't. I was like, nah, man, these are... And then I found that there's different kinds of autism, of course. But coming back to you, like I say, a bit aggressive, loud, 
uh, forthright and over the past few months that I've had conversations with you, um, that is just how you are and um, you're honest about what you say and what you think. And sometimes it's a bit awkward for a person like me and I suppose for normal people as you would <laughs> as you pointed me out once but um, overall I would say that you have uh, good thoughts good intentions um, and nothing that made me feel uncomfortable or intimidated although like I said you were you know but aggressive and a bit loud in the start and uh, or when we met and you also you, you maintain that you maintain that that's your your character it's another uh, trait of mine and which is part of autism is that i struggle sometimes to regulate what is loud what is soft and how to you know put my voice there um you know regulate my voice and also people tend to think i'm aggressive because I have a different way of saying things and uh, it's just confusion and sometimes very direct and people might interpret it as aggressive like you in this case but it's more just me trying to make myself understood because I'm mostly very confused what people are thinking and sometimes I'm not even sure what, what really is going on in my head so it's all confusing. Youngsters, we grew up together, and I always viewed him as my younger brother. He was always a very quiet kind of child, very polite though. But he always used to spend a lot of time with himself. He had his favorite toys, and most amazingly, he used to allow me to come and sit by him and watch him play. And he used to smile at me, he was very quietish. Some people with autism, especially me, I don't have a good imagination. However, I have a very active inner world. I might not be able to picture faces and places and sounds and hear all the different things. However, I had a very active inner world, especially when some things interested me and my toys interested me. To the outside world, I looked quiet and just sitting or doing some things, but inside there was a whole active world going on, so I could spend lots of time just amusing myself. And I can remember as a child as well, he had his favorite plate, his favorite fork, <laughs> spoon, cup, and only him, and him only. Only he could drink out of it and eat out of it. He used to blow a gasket if anybody would try and eat out of it. I have logically chosen the most effective and efficient cutlery to use to eat. I like to have a routine and to know that I have decided what is my routines. And when others tell me I have to use other cutlery, it disrupts my routine completely because uh, change is something I struggle with immensely. And he had a fetish for silky female underwear. Oh my God. I mean, he was two years old, three years old, and he used to do that. It wasn't something that he was shown. It was just his own personal quirky ways. <laughs> his mom had a function. And Muhammad was fascinated with one of the females that was there because she was quite pretty. And she had on a skirt, the shortest kind of skirts. And he followed her around first playing with her hair because she had long hair, you know, that hung over her butt. And he touched her legs and eventually, you know, because he was small, him being three years old, uh, she didn't, she was a teenager, she didn't take note of it. She laughed at it and like, you know, he was cute and he was a very beautiful child. And then he started fiddling with her panties and <laughs> everybody laughed. And they used to tease his mom to say when he grows up he's going to be a Casanova. I now know that this is a form of sensory stimming. And this I would use to relax myself. Certain materials, how it feels, certain people or things, how it looks. I would use it to relax myself. For me it is kind of um, sad or hurtful because as long as I can remember everyone said you were just a sexual deviant from a kid and how can a kid 
you know, there was no sexual thoughts, it was just purely I need to relax and I need to grab those. And when they said, oh, you're going to be a Casanova, this just made me feel like a bad person until I found out I'm autistic and it was just a form of stimming. Other cousins couldn't understand why Muhammad used to have his favorite stuff and no, nobody could touch it. A little child of three years old and younger, that was his, they would purposely touch it and fiddle with it and he used to get very upset. I used to sit by him and he used to give me the stuff that I could touch. There was an incident once, I went to the shop for his mom. I was, I was about 12, 13 years old and there was boys pulling my hair in the shop and I ran to tell his mom. He was about seven, eight or nine years old and he ran to the yard. He went to fetch an enormous plank, ran to the shop to go and hit the boys, but of course the boys left already. Mohammed is, a, I would say, a very loyal kind of person. And when he loves and cares about you, he puts his absolute trust in you. That trust goes on forever. Binary thinking in autistic me. Um, don't have in between the states. So if I like someone, I really like them fully. And if I don't like them, I don't like them. And once I attach, I attach. And once I detach, it's a complete detachment. A lot of cousins couldn't understand him and why he was so fixated on his stuff. But I could, because he was protective of these things. What was his was his, and he never used to manhandle it or abuse it or break it. Muhammad used to like breastfeeding. He was already three years old. I think that was his way of bonding with his mom. He was very close to his mom, him being the baby and all. Food, even till today, it's my most favorite thing in the world. And that was a food I really liked. Actually, I stopped only at around about five. Or mother could get me to stop pause. She said, if you want to go to school, you have to stop because there's no way of breastfeeding at school. I wanted to go to school because I needed to learn things. So that's why I stopped. Teenager, extremely articulate and academically, I would say he was brilliant. So he's a perfectionist and he likes things a certain way. Others might find it annoying. I was taken aback. It was just one statement. That was when he said my daughter was overweight. Because at that period of time, I couldn't tell him that my daughter was on meds and that she had to have a breast operation. I wanted my cousin's child to stay in shape and just thought I would advise and give a feedback because I like people to tell me when I'm getting overweight. However, I never knew she was sick and she never told me. So if I knew this, I would definitely not have said that. You didn't mean it in a bad sense. But you know, at that period of time, we were going through a lot of crap. There was certain food stuff that you used to like eating. And um, I don't know if you can remember, but you used to like that tomato food your mommy made. And you used to tell your mother to make it at least twice a week. And of course, everybody didn't like tomato food. You know, your mom used to get a lot of visitors on Eid, and, and you couldn't always take the hustle and the bustle. And you used to tell your mom and my mom that you you can't you can't take it like when you're in your room, the bathroom was was right there, the in and out, in and out, and you used to find it very irritating. People used to do it on purpose, man. Bathroom to go and wash their hands, they came to do it in the kitchen. So you used to storm out there sometimes, go sit on the stoop or just wherever you used to go to. All this this all the disturbances and the noises and stuff used to overstimulate me and Sometimes I just do much and get a meltdown and go somewhere where I can calm down.